Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we're doing a little PhD student Q&A. If you're new here, my name is Kira. I talk about all things PhD and being productive while working from home or doing a PhD. And I'm doing Vlogmas because this is my first December here on YouTube and typically people will do Vlogmas where they vlog every day of the month of December and just have daily uploads. So that's not going to be necessarily realistic for me to be able to vlog every day, but I will be getting in some daily uploads. So for example, yesterday I uploaded a kind of working from home gift guide inside my vlog. And today we're doing a little Q&A, the reason being that I was away for a couple days this weekend and locally and I wasn't able to vlog as much. So we're doing a little cozy q and I've got a cup of peppermint tea to try to undo some of the lots of nice food and drinks that I've been having over, over the past few days to settle my stomach and replenish. And I feel like peppermint is kind of Christmassy, so... It's nice and cozy. So these questions I got from my Instagram. If you want to be part of one of these in the future, you would have to be following me on Instagram. So the first question is actually something I've been wanting to talk about for a little while, which is, would you recommend working and studying? So I'm guessing that means, would you recommend having a job while doing a PhD? And I think it very much depends on what kind of job you're looking to have and what your experience is with that kind of time management. So. For me, throughout my undergrad and masters, I worked between 20 and 30 hours a week outside of my full-time course. So I'm quite used to that. And for me, that pressure works quite well because I like having not much time to do things because it means I'll actually get them done. Whereas when I'm faced with an entire day of work, sometimes I feel like that's more difficult. So for me, time management wise, it's totally fine. And it's normal for me to have a job on top of another job but that will not be the case for any for everybody. And I think for a lot of people, it will be actually very stressful. The second thing to consider is the type of work you're going to be doing outside of your PhD. So my PhD itself, it's very analytical. It's a lot of programming. It's a lot of thinking. Any PhD will be a lot of like heavy, heavy brain work. So I think the job that you have outside of your PhD needs to be unrelated to your PhD in order for you to be able to do it and have it not affect your PhD work. So I teach drama about 15 hours a week outside of my 10 to 15 hours a week, apart from also having YouTube as, as somewhat of a job on top of my PhD. And both of those are so different. And the way that you use your brain is so different than working on a side project that is heavily related to my PhD. That would be something that would be really difficult to try and do in the evening, let's say after a full day of work or at the weekend when I should be having time not using my brain that way in order to give it enough time to rest. So I think I wouldn't recommend doing something heavily related to your PhD or that requires a lot of heavy brain work because your mind really does need time to rest and rejuvenate in order to actually be able to do your job well in the kind of work that is required for a PhD. So that's just something to consider. I think things like working in a restaurant, which is what I did for my undergrad and masters, worked fine because you could spend a whole day on assignments and like having a tough time with that kind of university stuff and then go and do that job without it too much troubling you. And similarly, that's not the kind of job where you take too much of it home um, and you don't, you know, end up doing stuff for that job at home. Whereas another job, you could end up having that problem. Do you have a nighttime or morning routine that helps you? So this is something that I did have before and it definitely was something that really worked and I have fallen out of it a lot recently. So I used to, when you'll see from some of my earlier vlogs, I used to get up super early. I would go straight to the gym and on the walk to the gym, which was usually about 45 minutes, I would listen to an audiobook. So I'd start my morning with a long walk, go to the gym, have some breakfast and then head into work. And that used to set me up so nicely for the day. And even in the beginning of working from home, I was doing that somewhat similarly. And it's something that I haven't been doing recently. And I've been finding that I definitely don't make the most of my mornings anymore. And I really do regret that. And I would like to start doing that again. So that's something I'm trying to build up in December. So that come the new year, I'm back to my best schedule in terms of that, because it really did used to set myself up really well. 
and I highly recommend it. In terms of nighttime routine, that's something I've never been super, super good at. And I've tried a lot of different nighttime routines, like doing yoga and like all these kinds of different things. And I just find nothing ever really works for me. So for me, I don't really like the evenings unless I'm doing things with people. And like, obviously during like lockdown or quarantine, you can't really do things as much. So I would prefer to just wake up really early and go to bed early and like not really mind that I haven't had a perfect nighttime routine. The next question is how do you manage stress efficiently? I wouldn't say I manage stress stress hugely well in, in a sense so I try to not give myself too much stress because I'm the kind of person who I will have nightmares if I'm stressed. So I have really bad anxiety dreams and that's how I know that I'm stressed. So usually I'll just take that as a sign that there's something not quite right. And I'll usually try and make an adjustment to my day or to my life in a larger change if it's it's quite bad. And I do think that can be, it's it's a tough thing. But apart from that, like I do try to incorporate different relaxation techniques. So. Because I did drama from a young age, at the beginning of every class, from the ages of like, from very young, we do this with all our students, we would have them do a relaxation exercise and a breathing exercise. And that really teaches you from a young age in terms of like how to manage feelings of anxiety or stress. And that's something that I still incorporate into my day when I am feeling like that. I have, yeah, tons of different relaxation exercises, but I use the app Calm, which does different like mindfulness things that can really help. Um, I also feel like it's important to, to really pay attention to when you're feeling stressed and figure out if there's a larger cause. So I know myself now I can't drink caffeine too much because it will make me feel anxious. So I can have a morning cup of coffee most days, but I can't have a second one very, very often. And usually I'll switch to decaf later in the day because I will feel very, very anxious otherwise and usually if i am feeling anxious you know there's no point in there's no point in continuing to work when i when i don't feel like i can so i usually just take the day off and really just try to relax try to do some some yoga or go for a walk i know that's a hard thing to say when everyone's sick of hearing that but like i am very lucky that i have green areas that i can go for a walk in i know not everybody has that have some herbal tea usually i will try to brain dump any of the problems like try you know use some sort of journaling techniques to get all of that out and usually that helps a lot so if you're feeling stressed mainly to do with things that you need to do i feel like planning really soothes me when i feel like i can't get everything done when i make a plan for how i'm going to get things done that really helps the next question is how to improve your scientific writing skills for writing publications. So I did an academic writing class in my university and I would highly recommend that if you have one of those and if you are doing credits or if you can audit classes, I would highly recommend doing a class in it. One of the biggest tips that people say is to just write very often because you'll get better at writing from both writing people's work, from writing as well as from reading. So reading papers frequently, you'll start to, and if you're reading them analytically or critically, you will start to understand what is good writing and what is not the best writing. And it, it'll just give you some practice. So if you can work either just reading papers in your own time, or if you can do some reviewing of papers, that can be very helpful. I would also recommend if you do have a research group in a university to swap your work amongst your peers and give some critical feedback of each other's writing. And that will really help because the more you write and the more you get feedback, the more you have a chance to improve. So that would be my biggest tips would be do a course if you can, either in your university or online and write frequently, read frequently and swap works and get feedback as much as you can. The next question is how to stay connected to, to other team members during lockdown. So gather is something that I've been using recently that I really enjoy. I have a gather site for the members of the PhD productivity community and we can do a meetup every week where we're doing working together like co-working in the virtual co-working space and it's a nice way to obviously meet some of you guys but also to catch up because I do this with some of my friends and some people from my university as well as a way to catch up and still work and you know it's just quite a nice thing the way it's laid out you're really able to just sort of go up to someone have a chat and then go off and and get your work done so that's a big thing if you have any kind of weekly meeting so I know my research group has a weekly meeting that helps a lot for people to be able to stay connected so if you don't have one of those 
ask someone in your university if you can set that up because I'm sure there's lots of other people who are feeling the same way as you and would love for that to be set up. The next question is, are advisors really as mean as they say? I am very lucky. I have two great supervisors and even the other members of my research panel are great. All of the supervisors I've ever worked with personally have been so lovely. So I am very lucky. But I know, you know, other people have tougher experiences where they their supervisors can maybe expect too much without offering much assistance. And unfortunately, that's just the way it is most of the time, unless you can get a new supervisor if that's something you really want to do. But at the end of the day, I think it's important to remember that this is your PhD. They're just there to assist. And it's really down to you how good a PhD you wanted to do. I feel like people expect too much of their supervisors sometimes and that's what where the problems can lie. Like you can't expect them to be telling you exactly what to be doing and ex you know all of that. You really need to take things into your own hands at some point and, and come up with your own research plan and present that to them, see if that's okay and then work from there rather than expecting them to sort of spoon feed you everything I think that can be one of the problems that happens but I do understand that every situation is different and there will be times where people just aren't getting the assistance they need which is unfortunate and it's, it's not ideal especially for something when you have a longer time with that supervisor I think for a master's like you can kind of get over it because it's only a couple of months but for a, a three or four year degree or longer for some people, it's not ideal. So it's very important to always make sure you vet your supervisor in some sense. So do meet them before you sign up to work with them. Check out some of their previous students, have a chat with them and see if there's any like red flags for you because it'll be a very important thing to get right will be the supervisor for your project. The next question is how many hours should I study for a PhD and I had a similar question which was do you find it very time consuming? So like a PhD is a full-time job and I think that's something that people never really quite get unless you're applying for PhDs because when I tell people that my job is doing a PhD people always look at me very strangely if they're not in that academic world and don't really have a sense of that like being a student isn't a job except that it is it's my job and you know I get paid for it <laughs> so it is a full-time job so I wouldn't say it's time consuming any more so than any other job like there are definitely times where I'll end up working at the evening or weekend time when there's a submission coming up but there also is times where I can then take time off after that because there's nothing on in a sense, like I've finished something like that and I can take a few days to balance things out. And I really like that flexibility that we have, especially because of having other things outside of my PhD. If I ever need to take a day and work on theatre school stuff, I can make that up at the weekend, you know, for the PhD work instead. So no, I don't find it very time consuming, but it is a full-time job. So it depends on what you really expect. I think, I know some people work crazy hours on their PhD and I don't think that's necessarily the best thing to do for me anyways because I know that I can only really focus on something for up to four hours a day where I'm like working on my research and then I can spend a couple of other hours in the day working on less re researchy stuff that's still important for the PhD. The next question is how to keep, keep yourself motivated. So I do have a ton of videos on setting short-term goals and I think that is the most important thing because obviously you can look at the PhD as a three or four year thing stretched out in front of you and it's just overwhelming. Whereas when you go and make a plan for your PhD, so recently I updated my Gantt chart of my four years and where I expect to be, you know, every couple of months. And within that, then there's different three or six month stretches of different things. So those are then gonna be your short term goals where you're trying to achieve those smaller things. And it's just so important because otherwise you don't really know if you're moving along. Making sure you give yourself different goals during the PhD or different like milestones to achieve, like your first conference submission, your first journal submission, all of these things, you know, mapping that out for yourself can be a great way to keep yourself motivated throughout the PhD, I think. In terms of general day-to-day -day motivation, I always give myself a couple of things to do on a given day. So I would plan out the things that I need to do for a given day and on a given week. And once I have those things done, I finish my work or maybe I'll get started on the next day's stuff in order to finish the week earlier. That's how I stay motivated to get my work done during the day. Because if I say I have to work from nine to five, 
then there's nothing really stopping me from messing about and not getting my work done. Whereas if I say I need to do X, Y, Z and then I can stop, then that's a lot more motivating for getting my work done. So that would be something that I highly recommend. It's not enough to just say you're working today. You need to have goals on a given day for what you want to get done or else you're never really gonna feel like you've achieved anything in a given day. It makes things a lot more difficult. The next question is what's the application process like? I do get asked about that a lot and I always tell people, you know, my process was different to what you probably would have in a normal course. My PhD is part of a center for research training and what that means is it's it's more so looking to get PhD students ready for industry afterwards. And there are certain things we need to do during the PhD, like an internship and like credits, all these things. But it also means that when I started my PhD, I didn't have a research project. We didn't have supervisors. Instead, during the first couple of weeks of the program, we met different supervisors. We talked about different projects that they had proposed and then we connected with a supervisor and started working with them. But usually what you'll do is you'll fill out a research proposal or something similar. You'll basically be applying with a project that you've chosen. That sounds really difficult and I'm thankful that I didn't have to do that, but that is something I get asked about a lot. I only did apply to my PhD program. Um, my application included like a CV and some sort of questions about like my background with different classes and programming and projects and work experience, you know, all the sort of somewhat usual things. And then we had um, two interviews, which were pretty much the same. It's just that I was meeting different supervisors as part of the course. And basically during that interview, I feel like it was somewhat similar to presenting what was in my application already, but they obviously would want to meet the person, see what they're like. And it was, I think it was almost more so personality based at that point because they wanted to make sure that the CV lined up with the person and that they would be the kind of person who's gonna be able to work at something for the next four years and who would be competent enough to do that. And then after that, yeah, we just got our notification that we got accepted. And I do think it's though, it's somewhat different to what other people would have as part of their um, program, so. I don't know if that's necessarily gonna be the best advice for you, but I think, yeah, well, that's all, that's all I can give because that's my experience with the application process. The next question is tips for introverts. And I find that kind of a tricky one because like I'm an introvert and I think personally doing a PhD suits introverts relatively well because a lot of the time you're working by yourself and you're working on your own project sure you have to talk to your supervisors and sometimes to other researchers. My course specifically is not well suited to introverts because it is cohort based so there's more of an expectation that you interact with the students more and not that it's anything personal I just am not designed that way that's not my ideal scenario I like to work by myself and I, I'm quite happy with the traditional on your own style of a PhD. I think people are put off by PhDs possibly because they think it will be very much working on your own and they don't wanna do that. But nowadays I think most, like in lots of universities, you'll be surrounded by other PhD students. So there's plenty of opportunity to chat to people, obviously not at the moment, but in general at normal times that you will be able to chat to other people and meet people and collaborate with people. The next question is what are the benefits of doing PhD? And again, I think stuff like that is something I get asked a lot, like, will doing a PhD help me get a job? And like, should I do a PhD or should I go and get a job? And like, I think if you're thinking about doing a PhD as like a monetary value thing that's gonna bring you in the future, like that's not gonna be enough to sustain you for four years. The reason that I want to do a PhD is because I really like learning and I really like being in academia in the sense of like, the environment of studying and learning new things and working on things that is difficult, creating new knowledge. That's why I wanted to do a PhD. It's a very like pure academic goal. And it's something that I would have always wanted to do, not even knowing what subject it's in, but like just wanting to do one for the sake of it. And I think I'm the kind of person, if I was a millionaire, I would stay in university forever doing different courses. So for me, it's more about the learning. It's not about what it's gonna bring me afterwards. Um, and I think that's, but I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of benefits because you can obviously then have the career path of being an academic, being a professor. You Possibly it will help you get more industry jobs. 
but at the end of the day it's just making sure that your reason for doing a PhD is going to be enough for getting you through that length of time because there will be times where motivation is beyond repair and you need to have your you know where you see yourself because of your PhD at the front of your mind. The next question is are there any entry requirements like publish articles or research during MA? Um, I do think it probably depends on the on the program you're going for. Me myself I had never submitted any papers before starting my PhD. I hadn't done any research. I hadn't had an industry job. Um, I had done an MSc a research MSc so I did do my research uh, thesis I didn't do an undergrad thesis um, but like I hadn't even passed my, my master's by the time I was applying and I also had a research internship lined up for the summer but again I hadn't done that when I was applying for my PhD either I'd never really been involved in any big machine learning programs or projects and um, so I do think it depends on the program for me, I was missing a lot of that kind of practical work. For me, I was missing a lot of that practical work, but I did have a lot of the kind of academic knowledge that would be required for my course. So I think it depends. As long as you've got enough of something, you could be okay. The next question is how to stay accountable working from home. So I sort of touched on that a little bit earlier. I find that using Gather and doing sort of accountability partners with people can really be helpful. So you could even do that like from having someone near university that you chat with during the day, like obviously not too much, but at the beginning of the day, let's say saying, I'm gonna get X, Y, Z done. They say, I'm gonna get A, B, C done. And at the end of the day, you check in and see, have you gotten your stuff done? And that can keep you accountable because you know you're gonna have to tell that person at the end of the day, I didn't get my work done because I was messing around on the internet. This was actually a suggestion by one of my friends in my university. Um, she wanted to get this going with a couple of us and we now do co-working sessions together on gather where we can see each other as we work we turn off our mics just so it's no distractions and um, but we can see each other and that really makes you want to do your work and not be going on your phone and um, we use pomodoro timers so again we do have that virtual co-working space for members if you're interested in doing that i'll have the membership link down below but we meet up once a week on gather for a couple of hours to get some good work and that can really help you stay accountable another thing is just holding yourself accountable so when you're setting yourself those daily goals and at the end of the day looking at your goals and saying did you get those done and really actually you know answering that for yourself is very important so that is part of the 12 week year process I'll have videos on that linked because you know the 12 week year process is very good it really starts to teach you how to be responsible for yourself with your own goals and to really you know say it's not enough to set yourself goals and say I need to get this done but actually going back at the end of the week and giving yourself a score of how much you actually tried to achieve your goals can really make a big difference so I think that helps the next question is what key criteria should you take into account when choosing your PhD program? That's a very good question. I'm trying to think, like for me, the most important thing was that it was in my university because I don't want to leave my university. It's somewhat clear at this point. Another thing that was important is like the range of projects and supervisors. So making sure that you're going to be able to do work that you want to do during that PhD. Another thing is the kind of extra things that go along with the program. So I was quite happy that my program had an internship as part of it because I didn't have the industry experience. Now I'm not sure if I 100% want to do an internship because I'm really enjoying doing the PhD and I don't really want to take time away from my program. But at the time that was something that I thought was really good and I was really happy that that was part of it. Other things like knowing the extras before you sign up. So like what do you actually need to do for this program to get your PhD? Are there credits involved? Is there an internship? Are there extra things like journal clubs, summer course things that you're gonna have to do? Um, do you have to do teaching hours? Is that included as part of your stipend that you get? Like, do you have to then teach for free on top of that? Or is that an extra thing you can do? And all of those things. So I think the most important thing is just are the actual requirements for this program and do those line up with something that seems reasonable for you. Another thing will be just how does the assessment work for that program? So I know that in my program, we have something called a stage two transfer where at, within the first 18 months, you need to meet a panel and they will decide essentially if you're gonna go on with your PhD or if you're going to essentially that you should leave the program but you still get a research master's at, at the end of it. 
So knowing the kind of assessment as well as part of your PhD is important. So I would, that would be something I'd want to know during the program. And finding out if there are extra things that you want to do, like, can you do those? So if there isn't an internship as part of the program, but you'd like to do one, ask, is that an option? Are you able to do like a study abroad? All those kinds of things, essentially making a list of what would be the things you want to do during your PhD that isn't necessarily advertised and finding out if you're able to do those. The next question is how to maintain your project plan when it's over a long period. So I think I've sort of touched on this and you know some of my other planning videos will help with that but essentially breaking up the long project into smaller project goals or milestones and then subdividing that again into little tasks for how you're going to achieve those milestones. So it's not enough to say like okay I have this project it's going to be going for the next year like there's different phases to that project like data collection, data cleaning, data analysis, summarizing the data, like the data, all these things and you know making up timelines for each of those individual things and then breaking up those into smaller tasks is the best way to sort of make sure you're going to be staying on track for this long-term project. So what are my favorite and least favorite things about doing a PhD? I don't like reading papers too much and it's something that you really need to do a lot of and sometimes I find that can be a bit annoying. I think that has to be that has to be it for me. So like the literature review I do find is the hardest section to write and that's because obviously there's so much reading you have to do and then like there's there'll be times where you've read loads of things that end up not even going into your lit review and it's just a bit frustrating and I know it's very important. I'm not saying that it isn't. It is super important to get a good literature review done so that you know you're at least not doing something that's already been done and also making sure that you take into account everything that has been done before starting yours. I'm making sure you know there might be similar techniques out there that you can use and things like that but it is very time consuming and I much prefer working on the actual project. My favorite thing about doing a PhD like I really do enjoy like doing the actual programming and getting you know some results out like actually finding pro finding solutions to the problems is very satisfying for me like I have a maths background so problem solving is one of my favorite things. Um, and I get a great sense of achievement out of it. So I love working on the projects and, you know, building different models and getting something like improving the accuracy and all those kinds of things, seeing a graph that just looks perfect. I get a great sense of, of achievement out of that. Maybe that's kind of not what you wanted to hear, but it is the truth. Any tips on the initial assessment? So in the first 100 days, I didn't have anything like that, but I would say what you'd want to have done in the first, that's like three and a half months is at least have a sense of the literature in some way, like not having read loads of things, but maybe having a good few key papers and a good few like key maybe books that you need to read as part of it and sort of a, already having a proposal for how you expect the next four years to go. Um, I think getting that done fairly early, even if it's completely wrong, it's good to get that out there and you know, you can then work with your supervisor to sort of tailor that a bit more. You know, having something like that, like getting yourself together in, the, in that initial time and sort of at least having a good sense of where your first project will be going, where your first, you know, the first thing you need to do, the first big thing you need to do as part of your PhD, like having a good sense of that for the first assessment, I think would be important. The other thing would be like, if there's anything else that's important as part of your program, like maybe doing your credits or teaching hours, just having a plan for those already early on can really help just to show that you're, you know, staying on track with all of those things. If there is like a ethics that you have to do, or if there's we had to do like research integrity training and I did that early on because obviously that's important to do early and to be able to just sort of tick those boxes, all the sort of add mini things early on would be pretty solid to get done. The next question is how do you deal with those OMG I don't want to do anything days? Unfortunately they do happen. I don't show them a huge amount because I try to show like the motivating days but I definitely will be showing days like that during this month. Um, already a couple of the days last week weren't amazing in terms of work but I think for me what is always the most important thing is just having a list of the things that you absolutely need to do that day and that week and once you've ticked those if you don't want to work anymore don't like you've gotten what you need to get done done and you should have a sense of the great picture of what you really need to do in a given week you know it takes a little while to work on that 
that's that's what gets me motivated to keep my to get my work going and like if I'm really not feeling it like I'll, I just won't work and I'll do the work a different day provided there's no deadlines that I'm going to be like hindering myself on if it's a Wednesday and I feel really like crap and I don't want to work I'll work on Sunday instead and that's something that helps me but everyone is different so I'd say trying to figure out what's the best thing for you in that way will be the best too but that that's what works for me the next question is the application process for a non-eu student unfortunately you know that's not something i'm really aware of i can only really talk about my own experience and i wouldn't want to give any incorrect advice because i'm sure it's like it'll be very important that you get the right advice there so i would recommend talking to someone in the university you want to apply for about their non-eu process because all universities will have a process for that um, I know lots of people in my university are non-EU students so I would recommend talking to a professional about that because that's just not something that I can really help you on and I don't want to be giving you the wrong advice. Also thanks to everyone who just put in some nice comments into the question box so I have a f you know someone saying they just feel motivated from watching the videos so thanks so much to to, to everyone who said things like that, I, I do appreciate it. What should you do during your PhD to make sure you get a good career out of it? or academic career especially like an important thing for an academic career will be the sort of research outputs like the papers so trying to ensure from an early stage that you know what your main targets are in terms of conferences and journals and making sure that then you're on top of those deadlines and sort of tailoring your projects around the year and around your publishing year to make sure that you get in those publishing deadlines and um, I do think that's something nowadays Unfortunately, people, uh, colleges and stuff tend to care a lot about those um, pu like publishing and research outputs and things like that. So that will be something I strongly recommend. As well, I think collaborations are important. So if you can collaborate with other universities, obviously talking to your supervisor about that, um, that would be great. Uh, showcasing your work as much as possible. So engaging in different scientific communication activities. So there's things like FameLab, there's Soapbox, universities love for their work to be shown so if you're very much engaged in scientific communication that's something that they're going to want to have around because they know that you're going to be in some way promoting their their work and promoting their university i guess other things would be just having trying to de generate some good relationships with people in the academic community of your university if that's where you want to work and also engaging in teaching activities. If you don't have to do that as part of your studies, you definitely should do it anyways, because obviously you're going to be you're going to be working on your ability to teach students during that process, and that's obviously going to be something that's very important for a career in academia. Um, so offering to do demonstrator hours or whatever tutoring hours, that whatever it is as part of your program or in a university. Um, and doing grading for different classes so offering your to help with your supervisor's classes and that kind of thing can really just show initiative in terms of academia and sort of work on those academic things if you have the opportunity to do peer reviewing that's also a great way to work on your academic skills and to also be involved in like grading for bigger projects like for doing maybe like if you can be like a research uh advisor for different projects for undergraduates for their you know thesis or something like that that again would be a great way to work on those academic skills the last question i have is do i actually contribute to the human history or is it just bs they feed you um like obviously i think it depends on your project but like i do think it's important to feel like your project is making a difference if that's something that's important to you so like for me I do feel like the applied research that I'm doing, it's going to be making something that's very useful for runners and I hope that it's going to be something that people will use and that will actually like give me a great sense of accomplishment because it's something that doesn't currently exist that would be very helpful for people and yeah I do think that is essentially what you're doing in a PhD is trying to create new knowledge and trying to do something that's never been done before. Um, Obviously the, the scale of it really depends on your project but I think as long as it is something that's impactful and meaningful to you then that's the main thing. That is it for this Q&A. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for all of your questions. If you'd like to be involved in other Q&As in the future be sure you're subscribed down below and be sure you have followed me on Instagram so you can engage in the questions. Thanks 
everyone thanks to my wonderful members i'll see you all on gather sometime in the next week and i'll see you all in the next video mm -hmm.